In my novel, The Laotian Fragments, there is a character who is known only as Weird. He's a very conventional fighter pilot. He's flying T-28s in the secret war in Laos. Uh, you see him early in the novel, getting drunk, doing all kinds of things. But you find out, as Bill Lake, the main character, does about halfway through the book, that there's another side to him, that he cares in a way that fighter pilots aren't supposed to. A friend of his got shot down. He writes this poem, words for Don Morris, a T-28 pilot, killed in action, May 1970. Half a century gone. An image persists, born when spads and fockers dueled. They ra rarely really fought. Men with tiny airplanes, shined boots, smiles and scarves, whine of wound up engines, torque, smell and chatter of guns, watching for whims of weather or a blown jug. Now, technology intrudes. Pilots in their air conditioned world seem far above all that, sometimes. There are still a few who strap into small birds, call clear, cough from backfire smoke, groan off the ground and shudder skyward, bombs rigged with bailing wire and wood blocks hanging upon a prop. These could care less about refueling tracks or radar plots. Their need is to dodge, dodge thunderstorms, skim peaks, keep lead in sight. Bomb laden, to climb above the clouds is to stagger on the edge of a stall. It is enough to reach the target, hit it, and return. Their textbook, written for an older war, these pilots fight and often die in this one. It is good to know that some men still fly with scarves and laughter, as real pilots always have and always will. But as Weird completes his tour and goes home, we find a very different outlook on his experiences. And this poem I, I've never read a lot, never read before. Uh, it's entitled Words and Thoughts, and the thoughts are in italics. And so I'll be looking this way when, I'm, when the person is speaking, and when the person is thinking, I'm going to be looking this way. That doesn't mean that the garrulous people are here and the thoughtful people are over there. <laughs> Not at all. And there is some jargon in this. T-lock is tie for lover. Butterfly is to run around and be unfaithful. Short time, about to be rotated home. Nitnoi is tie for small. Chai is tie for true. And the place referred to Japan is the place that no one wanted to fly over in Laos. Words and thoughts to a lady alone at a Thailand bar. Hey, you, you slant-eyed, luscious, brown-skinned broad. Why you no smile tonight? What you no have? Where your Zumi, T-Lock man who keep you, pay you, love you? He butterfly around again? Maybe he go states and sing for you. <laughs> Big joke. It never happened. He buddy me. He hot jet jockey. Sure, but he have wife. Three baby son. He short time. He speak lie. But no worry, babes, no sweat. I tell you true. You have long legs, great calves, soft, rounded thighs. You need no Hong Kong bra. You number one. You nice girl, you not nitnoy. You super tie. I same same. No have mama son like him. You be my tilak, I extend a year. I make love good, always use balloon. I long time love you, mock mock. Chai? Don't cry, please. I, I'm so sorry. I, I no try to hurt you. I, I just make damn silly joke. I'm a lonely pilot, very far from home who plays the game. I dumb G.I. You're t like good man. Marry you someday. Please. What's the matter? What you say? He shot down? He worked Chapone today? I didn't know. Flew last night. Slept all day. You love that part of him he let you love, I know. But so did we. Please, stop your crying and forgive us all as well as me. Uh, this next poem is dedicated to Bruce Weigel. It uh, concerns events that took place at the University of California Davis Vietnam Conference in 1997, where for the first time at a major conference on Vietnam, there were members of the 
uh, reigning government at this particular point, formerly the North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese, and war veterans and protesters. What the conference did not anticipate was that literally hundreds of the South Vietnamese expatriates who live in the California area would come to protest the presence of their former enemies, the former North Vietnamese. And so what happened was that the local and campus police had to set up a screen around the building. We had to show ID cards to go in to make sure that we weren't going to disrupt everything. And the poem, and Bruce and I were both there, and this poem comes as a result of it. Firebase Davis. <laughs> Defined by yellow crime scene tapes, our conference room's perimeter is, paroled by, is patrolled by campus cops while South Vietnamese expatriates march outside, wave yellow and red striped flags, shout, down with the communists. Some wear fatigues or cami tops or red berets. Others, camcorders wearing sport running suits and Reeboks. Reeboks? This scene jars my eye, muddles my memory, defies anyone's attempt to keep things only as they were. And the final poem takes place not in Vietnam or the United States, but in Portugal. I left the Air Force Academy on the 1st of October, 1974. Two days later, I was in Portugal in the middle of a revolution. Uh, the Portuguese government had just been overthrown. As a result, we traveled north to a town named Conimbriga, which is probably one of the most interesting small towns that I've ever seen. And this poem, in a way, sums up what we've been trying to do at this conference, to show the relationship between art and life. And it's dedicated to Yusuf Kumanyaka for what he said yesterday, quote, art is what endures, unquote, and to John Balaban for what he also said yesterday, the force of culture seen through poetry. Conan Briga, for those who would purge society by fire. One. Not Lusitanians, the natives, whose wild land it had always been, nor Celts, newly Nordic, unable to define themselves, nor Phoenicians, ship-hardy seamasters, fleeting shore users, nor Greeks, transient, hating the raw winds of the sharp valleys, nor Carthaginians, exploiters, domination prone but soft, but Romans. Ah, the Romans, land grabbers, empirically heavy of foot, horse, arms, thought. <coughs> Only Romans could have built this Conumbriga here in Portugal. Two. Decius Brutus, one reads, sent a phalanx or two up the old Braga Road and after pitching tents, plucked some slaves from the woods and built the towering aqueduct which still slants roughly two miles downward. Vineyards grew later after the water came. Then the stone block, stone block pavements, chariots, statues, houses, baths, and women. Ah, yes. The Roman women. Three, how they must have graced the house of the mosaics, the entrance vestibule, the peristyle, the triclinium, clustering round the pools, the impluvii, talking of Rome, waiting perhaps for Agrippa to make a visit of state, or slithering through the baths, first the warm baths, then the hot baths above the hypocaust. Smoldering slaves, fanning the flames below, rarely saw all this, but the soldiers did. Four, yes the soldiers. But what legionnaire could design an atrium's dazzling mosaic floor? What officer, loyal to his country, ever coveted such ornamental birds and fishes? What really noble Roman tiled these pools or chose that blood-red stucco for his general's woman's walls? What soldier sculpted Conumbriga into a Rome away from Rome? Artisans, of course, could do so, but never soldiers. Five. Look, citizen, newly Christ-conscious soldiers did build that high wall there, some of which remained. See? They stacked the marble house blocks on the aqueduct, then chinked the holes with shattered statue heads. Hastily, after the forest had begun to rumble and the white-gowned women started packing up for home, one wonders what the soldiers wondered when the Goths came howling from the north, seeking their own destiny. Empire ruined. Blood dust. Six. Now, in Conumbriga, 
One sees only patterned floors, squares, circles, semicircles, column fragments. One can but imagine ceilings, porticos, an arch here, another there, the whole imperial city as it might have been. And flesh upon those bones there, still lying in the baths where the vandals threw the raped Romans before they raised the town, as the Moors did later with them, stuffing these same pools and baths with dead and dying Visigoths. No one will ever be quite certain here just whose remains remain. Seven, look, look at just one floor, look. Perseus is patterned, holding a pattern of Medusa's head, enclosed in geometric swirls, something at last endures. These whorls and squares and semicircles, a mosaic truth that can't be overthrown. Thank you very much.